I'm very honored and very excited uh, to be able to present the panel today and to, and to work with them. Um, as we've been doing, I'm just going to uh, give a fairly brief introduction and assume that, that most of you guys have already read the biographical information in, in the program. Um, and then I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak for about five or seven minutes or so on their, their take on uh, what is the work of a writer in a wounded world. And we'll kind of let them bounce off each other for a while and, uh, and just see how it goes. And, and eventually, of course, we'll, we'll get to, to your questions and also anything that you'd like to, not just questions, but comments or, or advice that you'd have about, about the question. Um, we have Stan Robinson on the end. Stan is a much lauded uh, science fiction writer. Uh, in the middle here we have Brenda Hillman, who is a, a poet. Pri are you primarily, do you write nonfiction too, primarily poetry? No, but they kind of blend together. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brenda Hillman is, is a poet, has won many, many awards and published many books of poetry. And here we have uh, Gretel Ehrlich, who is a nonfiction and fiction writer. Um, and uh, I think I'll just go ahead and turn it over to you guys. Who would like to start with uh, what is the work of a writer in a wounded world from your point of view? Should we just go in order? Yeah, go ahead. Gretel, do you want to start? Okay. <laughs> 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 well, I was, I was really inspired by Robin's talk just now. When she talked about falling through other worlds, we're suddenly falling through other worlds that Sky Woman uh, did remind me, to pick up from where I left off last night of the dog sled in northwestern Greenland, going through the ice suddenly when the ice started, the seasonal sea ice started becoming thin and, and impermanent, that we fell into the water. But I, I think of us falling into another world, into what glaciologist Jason Box says, calls new climate land. We are now in new climate land. We are no longer in the, the paradise of the interglacial where everything seemed to be um, working, where it was the self-regulating universe. We've overridden the self-regulation. And um, so our carbon sins have um, wrenched climate with the consequence of uh, a variety of weather situations into um, what may quickly become uninhabitable places. So as a writer, and, and what J Jason Box, one of the few scientists who has the guts to just say what's <coughs> happening, when it's happening, um, I, like him, think I cannot sleep at night. I could not sleep at night. I could not live with myself if I didn't do everything possible to alert the world, uh, hopefully some readers left in the world. Um, but I'm also working in other medium, in theater and, and all kinds of ways, to alert the world to what's happening on a global level. Um, because climate is global. It's, it's, it has um, local expressions, but it's global unless we understand the whole global oceanic uh, circulation and the um, relationship of, of earth and ocean to atmosphere, um, that water vapor is now the prolific greenhouse gas. It has overridden CO2. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have really complex chemistries going on and complex circulations that affect everybody in mm -hmm. sometimes diametrically op opposite ways. And so we have to enlarge our brains. We have to surrender more magnificently and openly to um, the, these consequences. And to, first of all, you know, look at them mm -hmm. really deeply. We have to become citizen scientists. We have to. Uh, I really recommend uh, logging on to Climate Progress, which is a, which will come every day, um, and also Climate 
denial croc of the week. It sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but they're actually the best at, at compiling everything that comes up in the news from NASA, you know, you know, world-class sites and, and giving to them to you every day. Um, mm. So th this is the way we become lay scientists is by educating ourselves. Um, and then from there to, to look at the, the world around you in the sense, with always in the sense that we're falling through into a new world and that each day another door opens and we descend deeper and deeper into a, a, a completely different world. That's, that's the signature of abrupt climate change is that things will be entirely, radically different from day to day. Um, and to be able to meet that changed world, fully awake, fully alive, not just to be a victim, not to just be a whiner, not to, um, I mean, we are in the midst of this extended farewell, but at the same time we have to greet um, whatever that changed world is with all of the kind of joy and sorrow, that mixture um, of joy and <laughs> sorrow and liveliness that we met the interglacial paradise that we all came from. And it's shocking, but you know, we forget that in between every breath is death. That, um, so between hope and hopelessness is this, this sudden fall. Glub, 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 I call it. <laughs> or ouch, <laughs> ouch, ouch, you know, the walking on on dead grass, and I mean, right now we have live grass. It's really hard to talk about climate change in California because the whole place is green. It's just ridiculous. And, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, this may be the yeah, last green there, or maybe it will be like this for a long time. You know, it's unpredictable, but, but you, you know, to, to become an ally of unpredictability and to then use it in your writing. I mean, what better sort of juice for your writing than a, a, a changing world that's, that's just different? I mean, sometimes during the day, things change. I mean, I was just in Southern California where Santa Ana winds are blowing, um, and it was 91 degrees in San Inez Valley. And, and so, you know, things shift rapidly. So it's the, the call not only to, I mean, in order to send this out into the world as writers, we have to be so open and um, sponge-like so that we notice all these changes. We have to keep track. We have to monitor grasses mm -hmm. and weeds and uh, wildflowers and birds <laughs> and, and um, clouds and rainfall and and snowfall and what's the snowpack in the sierra what is you know what's beyond that what's uh, what is the temperature of the ocean i mean Thoreau took the temperature of walden pond which is this you know shitty little pond basically if you look at it you know we have magnified it into a whole world i mean because he was taking the temperature of the world every day and and john muir talked about tracing the history of the world in a single raindrop that's what we all have to do. Thank you, Gretel. And Brenda, would you like to respond to that and then take off on what you have to say about it? Well, that, that's so um, absolutely true about being, being educated and being aware on a daily basis. And I love the way you talked about the, the between states, between hopelessness and hopefulness that came up a lot last night. Um, and I was thinking about, about your term, extended farewell, and how that, that rescues both, both conditions in some way. Mm. Because it's, it's extended and it's a, certain, it's a certain state, but it's also very hopeful. It includes that. Yeah, so that, that's beautiful. And I so, um, I so appreciated that in, in, your, uh, in your book about the, the wave. It, it's profound. Um, so I, I come as a, as a modernist experimental, uh, 
I guess you could call me a spiritual nature poet in some, some definitions, um, political spiritual nature poet. When they ask you on the airplane, you know, what you do, <laughs> um, you have to have like this little tag. I usually say, well, I'm sort of a spiritual nature poet. Um, and then I think, oh my gosh. And then they don't talk to you the rest of the time. <laughs> Uh, and then they, then they always say, I don't read much poetry. <laughs> and, um, and I say, well, did you read it as a child? And they always say they did. And they always say they wrote it as a child. And then I know we can start the conversation. Um, but, but I wanted to, um, today I, I'm really happy to be here, first of all. And just thanks to the organizers and thanks to Anne for putting together the panel. And um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe poetic values that I see that you can take into your lives, not just as writers, but also as activists. And, um, and I took the title rather seriously, um, the work of the writer in the wounded world being four W's. And uh, we um, leaving leaving off the woman writer because Stan is is here too, but um, <laughs> <laughs> and Bob last night, my beloved. So I I just um, I feel as if we we have to invoke the spirits of of doubt and uncertainty, and paradox and confusion and um, modernist fragmentary states and indeterminacy and all those things that we don't necessarily want in our, in our activist practice. We want, um, to go sort of headlong into kind of, you know, the, the knowledge base, um, which, which science brings us. Um, but the, the sort of magical spiritual end of, of things for me is always about confusion and doubt and not knowing how things are going to turn out or being at the other end of an action and you don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and the little anecdote I wanted to bring to that was um, Bob and I were uh, had decided to go to DC to protest the Keystone Pipeline um, and we, we were in touch with Bill McKibben and he said, well, you know, this is the first time Sierra Club had, had actually decided to risk arrest and, um, and so we, we, you know, went across the country, as the, as the participant last night said, should fly less, but this seemed like getting on the airplane was important. So we went to DC and we were um, participating in the, in the um, disobedience action. And, um, and I looked in back, it was right in front of the White House, and I looked in back and I thought the grass was dry and it was very bare, it was exactly this time of year. Um, and I looked at the dry grass and I thought of all the worms underneath just in their state of, of wormness um, making their own laws and having nothing to do with the White House and having nothing to do with us and, and having their wormy life um, completely apart. And it seemed like a poetic uh, state of being to be able to, to be both. Like, I know I'm here as a human and as a poet and as a confused person and as an angry person, but also there are these worms to be aware of. Um, and that ties in a lot with what Robin was saying earlier, to be animate in many ways. Um, and then when they, when they put the handcuffs on us, I thought, I wish these were the corn-based handcuffs <laughs> instead, of, instead of the damn petroleum byproduct <laughs> and, um, and, and I thought you know there's there's something about the paradox of being of being human that you just have to keep in your writing practice and in your obviously in your activism um, and that that seems really important and then then the third poetic moment <clears throat> for me was <clears throat> I have a, a tattoo on my my left ankle and the young officer asked, well, do you have any identifying marks? Do you have any tattoos? And I had to describe the, al the tattoo to him. And I said, it was an alchemical tattoo. And he said, would you spell that? <laughs> so I, I thought, well, this is my sort of teacher education moment. I can, I can go into alchemical, uh, like, OK, a little alchemy lesson here. Um, but you know, the, so I think. For me, it's always been a challenge to bring 
whatever I am as a poet, which is all very, it's very spiritually multi-layered. Like I always want to bring, you know, talking rocks and all of these things into my poetry and multi-levels of existence and communication with dead souls and, um, and lots of fragmented sentences that represent states of mind. And yet, when you work in any kind of environmental, um, you know, activism, it's, it is much more about getting things done on the other end. And those are sometimes seem to me in conflict. And I don't think we can separate them. I think we have to do both. And um, for me, that comes at the level sometimes of language. Sometimes it comes at the state of composition. Um, and always to be aware, like Robin was saying, of how language is used or misused. Um, and an example that I thought of recently was, um, well, I just, I hate when something becomes reified in the culture like fiscal cliff. And then people start saying fiscal cliff. And everyone says fiscal cliff. And you see the cliff. And you see us all falling over it like lemmings. And just because they've used the word cliff, it suddenly an abused concept, and we, we suddenly reify this thing so that we go on creating, recreating the metaphor. So paying attention to our metaphors all the time. And same with oil spill. Like if you say spill, it is not a spill. It is not. Spill is a milk accident for children. <laughs> not spill. So, so as writers paying attention to words on the, the minute level and, um, you know, the wounded, I think, is probably, um, you know, what the whole day is about. Um, how to be in relation to what we perceive as what we are doing as humans and to be less um, part of the problem. So anyway, I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you. <laughs> Stan? Well, thank you. Um, I'm happy to think that today I'm speaking to you, this particular audience, uh, not just for myself, but for the science fiction community. Uh, because I don't think that science fiction is maybe the first literature that you think of uh, when you think of women in the land and the geography of hope. But, um, and I know from the movies and from the long history of science fiction that it has a reputation that is uh, um, in, in many ways well deserved for a certain uh, craziness, technophilia, boys with toys, and um, uh, a disconnection from the earth. However, I think I also can just um, invoke the name of Ursula Le Guin and hope that you all uh, recognize that and, and have uh, taken on an, as part of your um, reading and mental life. And um, Ursula is not an anomaly uh, in the world of science fiction, but just one uh, great representative of an entire wing. Because science fiction is about the future, and the future is a contested space that belongs to all of us. Oh. And so um, the word hope, speaking of words in particular, is really a, a future tense. It is a, a science fiction in itself. Hope is a utopian science fiction story you tell yourself. And it's ubiquitous. So uh, in, in this case, science fiction is an appropriate thing to invoke. And the future, we all think about the future all the time in our plans and in our, in our hopes and in our fears. So the, you can quickly break down the, the feelings about the future into two rather uh, basic and fundamental feelings, which is hope and fear. And uh, fear is a very strong uh, feeling in all biological creatures. And feelings are older than human beings by a long shot. Feelings are possibly bacterial, but in any case very ancient, predate humans, and they're powerful. So uh, fears and hopes, and in the science fiction context, you could just say that those were uh, dystopias and utopias. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of them. And um, science fiction has always been really good at expressing the way a, a particular moment, a particular culture feels about its future. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a culture where there's lots of dystopias, you have a culture that's feeling a lot of fear. And um, that's really, 
true right now, but it's almost always true that the dystopias are vivid, exciting, and they dramatize our fears. And so um, we like to go there the way that you touch a, a sore spot in your mouth over and over with your tongue to kind of explore your fear and see whether you can master it by confrontation. And it's dramatic. It makes for good stories. So utop hope, utopias, are more fragile and more uncommon because hope itself is a little bit more fragile of an emotion. Um, one of the most pessimistic of the philosophers, I think it was Schopenhauer, uh, <laughs> defined hope as um, a wish that we doubt will come true. <laughs> and um, I'm thinking there may be some truth to that. Philosophy often has truths. Um, but hope is stronger than that because of this deep biological urge. You, you wake up hoping to get fed. It's, a, it's an underlying ground base to our emotional states. And it's a little bit painful to feel hope because, and a little dangerous because so many hopes are going to be disappointed. They are indeed wishes that we doubt will come true because they're unlikely and they won't come true. And as individual mortal creatures, many of our hopes are, are in fact going to be shattered. So, um, it's tenuous, and yet uh, there's a stubbornness to hope. It keeps coming back, and there's a stubbornness to utopia as a literature. It keeps coming back. And uh, I can point to a couple of great utopian instances of effects in the real world, and they were in bad times. In the Gilded Age, after the Civil War, uh, capitalism was running rampant across the American West. It was a dismal time because people had hoped that the Civil War might bring a better union in its wake, and instead we had the Gilded Age. And in that time, Edward Bellamy wrote, um, looking backwards from the year 2000, and this was a uh, Bellamy clubs uh, gathered all around the nation. It was essentially socialism he was talking about, and it sparked the progressive movement that changed the way that we vote for the Senate and changed the way we protect the land. And this was just one rather uh, badly written and boring utopian novel. <laughs> The, only, the first good utopian novel, in fact, is Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed from 1974. Mm -hmm. But the other example I would bring up is H.G. Uh, Wells, who in the worst decades of the 20th century, between World War I and World War II, he kept stubbornly writing utopian novels. They are not his famous books. They're all forgotten. And yet, after World War II, when they had to reconstruct the world order at Bretton Woods and elsewhere, um, uh, they were using H.G. Wells' ideas of a social safety net, of a scientific meritocracy that would try to be sensible and use science to comprehend how the world worked and then apply it as best we could in a kind of medicinal way to make the world better. And the UN and the reconstruction of the post-war order was as in part inspired by H.G. Wells' stubborn efforts in the 20s and 30s. So, um, the work of a writer in a wounded world is, I think, first to witness another W. You just say, look, this is what's happening. You have to witness first. And then secondly, uh, a diagnostic. Why? And there's another W. It doesn't sound like it. Why are things happening the way they are? And here, you've got to go beyond these uh, common, uh, these, these bad metaphors, these bad, uh, false analogies, and actually begin to think about the badness of capitalism in relationship to the natural world that we live in, how, uh, how we still live in a hierarchical, extractive, and essentially feudal world, and not get caught up in essence, uh, you know, uh, quite, people are like this, human nature is like this, women are like this, men are like that. You've got to actually look at the economic rules that we've set up for ourselves and say, if we lived by different rules, if we gave ourselves different rules and lived by them, human nature itself might be different and give that a shot. That's the diagnostics. Then um, science fiction does a thing called cognitive estrangement. Make the familiar seem strange. Ursula Guin in The Left Hand of Darkness. Everybody doesn't have gender. They're all just uh, E, or I guess we should call it... Um, what was Robin's word this morning? Key. So key does this, key does that. Uh, um, on a monthly basis, you become a sexualized either male or female, have partners, have children. The great sentence of the uh, left hand of darkness is the king was pregnant. Um, 
and, uh, and that's a, that cognitive estrangement has never gone away from my mind. Um, mm -hmm. That essentially, for so many uh, elements of life, it doesn't really matter. Uh, gender doesn't matter. We're all just human beings together. So cognitive estrangement, and this is something out of poetry. All science fiction is a kind of symbolist poetry, like Mallarmé or something, uh, really French symbolism. That's what science fiction is always doing. These odd worlds are ways of looking at right now, but making it strange. And then lastly, you write utopia. You write down your hopes. You say, it could be better. And that way you fight this, this message, there is no alternative. This is Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. Well, of course there are alternatives, and this is what science fiction is doing all the time, and this is what all writers should be doing all the time. Things could be better if we were to do X, Y, and Z, and then let me describe to you what that's like. And often it would be, you know, a day out on Point Reyes is already a utopian description, right? And so um, all these can be folded in into your writing. Thank you, Stan. I'm, I'm really moved by what you said because um, uh, my, the one novel that I've, that I've written is about uh, mountaintop removal strip mining, and it's a novel that's more a novel of witness and documentation than, uh, as I've realized later, than imagining forward. And I feel that one of the, the weaknesses of that novel is that, that I was unable to imagine forward in the ways that you're talking about that you can do with utopia in science fiction. And a pressing question and I think is relevant to this, which I'm actually stealing from Kathy Moore. She brought up at a gathering I was at a few weeks ago, and I'd like to ask um, all three of you is, um, and, and Stan, you've already started to answer it via science fiction, but what, how, and I think maybe some of you have the same question, how do we tell the truth about contemporary uh, environmental issues and not have people turn away from despair, paralysis, sadness, guilt, uh, how do, how do we tell the stories if they, they keep listening to us? And I think one way that Stan has talked about is, is the utopian story, the hope story, other ideas that, that you have. Well, Anne, I just wanted to respond to your description. I, I mean, I was thinking, because I was, I've been reading your novel, and it, the, there's such depth when Bant, your, your character, looks at that mountain for the first time and interacts going so deeply into that emotion and that feeling, mm -hmm. it's, not ho it's not a hopeless feeling to go mm -hmm. deeply into an emotion, mm -hmm. even horrible grief. It's, it's when we stop with the sort of sentimental level of it, mm -hmm. I think that it feels hopeless, but when we go deeply and mourn appropriately, I think it's not. And, and so I, I find a lot of hopefulness in the interaction of your characters mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. well, thanks. Any uh, other, yes, Stan? Yeah. Well, I would, uh, it's always um, easy to make the case because it's true that life is robust and if anything but extinctions can be um, recovered from. So landscape restoration, uh, essentially you can point out the things that are uh, bad, that are going wrong, that we're uh, doing poorly and, and point, and, but I think you can always hold on to this. Life is robust, and if we don't drive species into extinction, the work of landscape restoration will be the work of the next couple centuries of civilization, mm -hmm. and it's good work, mm -hmm. so, and it's interesting. So especially when you're talking to the young, you know, what's in it, you, the message to the young is very often, well, we torched the world, sorry, you have to live like saints, you don't get to fly anymore, um, because we did too much of that, and, um, you know, good luck to you. Yeah. We got to go to Paris, <laughs> but you can't. Yeah, uh, young people uh, naturally don't like that message, but if, you, uh, <laughs> if the message is you've got a project, life has a meaning, you are not trapped in existential nausea of meaningless life. There is a project, which is to make a sustainable civilization. It's a, it can take up the whole of your life and it can be a good project and it means something. Well, this is a great gift. I wanted to ask what you meant by new by new rules because I've I've worked a lot with Congress and I feel it is so dysfunctional to try to work through the system. So of course I believe the system should be thrown over, but I don't know how to go about <laughs> that as a sort of rash. And I don't believe too much in rationality at this point either. But the, but the whole business of of creating a, a shared system of new rules that won't be uh, um, just 
immense. I mean, I was thinking when Gretel, when you were talking, like there's something about you breathe deeply and you think there's death between every breath. Um, what you know? What do you mean by new rules? Well, uh, Raymond Williams said socialism will be more complicated than capitalism, and so it's not like a matter of simplifying or going backwards. Um, um, there's a horizon which can be radical, is to say that things should be just, and then there's the current situation that we're enmeshed in where you've got to actually have a practical program. So I think you need to keep both at once. Mm -hmm. In terms of a practical program, you have to drag the Democratic Party further to the left and make it more, and you have to convince everybody that you talk to that whenever it's a question of government versus private business, you should support government because it's of the people, by the people, and for the people. Everything should be a public utility district. Um, there should be lots of tax and spend. Uh, Piketty's great suggestion that you not only progressive taxation on income, but on capital assets itself the scary notion that there should be horizontalization of wealth. Well, these are all uh, legal reforms, and you know, they, before 2000, 2008, it would sound like science fiction craziness. Now, it's just like, well, we need to do these things as fast as we can, and people are receptive to it. At, at least certain crowds are. <laughs> but, but there's also things like, you know, solar panels could be put into the, the building code you can legislate forward. Yes. You yes. know, we're, we're forced to put in double pane windows. I remember when that came in, I was really pissed off. They can't tell me what to do. <laughs> well, now I get it. <laughs> so why not, so every new building, both, you know, a residential and commercial could just say, you have to have solar panel. You have to do net metering if you're near a, a meter. And, uh, you know, there's so many forward things that could be done put into the legal system and um, yeah, so there's, there's good. But I, I had a talk one a couple of years ago or a year ago with um, E.O. Wilson and, uh, and I was look, I said, you know, we're doomed, aren't we? And he said, oh, don't look so sad. All we have to do is to behave altruistically. I said, oh yeah, like the ants. And, and, <laughs> and he said, now, now, now. <laughs> They had a lot of good ideas. But he said, no, really, what we have to do is to um, put on a suit of armor, to um, learn to walk in a new landscape, to see a lot of dead bodies along the way, to step over them, and to begin to act collaboratively. And altruism will follow. And um, that's sort of a big request. But maybe that is sort of what has to happen as humans are called from life on the planet because there's not enough water or food. And we, you, you know, we have to start thinking of what we're going to, how we're going to behave together and how we're going to make that work legally, politically, com you know, lo communally or co communitally. How do you say that? It needs to be, <laughs> you know, in our communities, um, <laughs> how we, you know, how we become a food sharing society, a water sharing society, um, how we welcome in climate migrants who are going to be at all of our doors, um, who and how we're going to keep their cultures intact, how we're going to identify our own, what is our culture, because we're sort of mutts, and what is the mutt culture? Um, you know, all these, these are all things that we can work on and that we can even locally, you know, start to describe laws and rules that, that um, enable and enforce us to do those things. Everybody should have a garden. Every, the, every school should have a vegetable garden. I mean, California, the, you know, we, we're the ones that have done this and can do this and then to set an example for the rest of the country, um, and how are we going to make space for people who live in other ways? How are we going to make space in our hearts for them? You know, E.O. E. Wilson is a great figure to invoke. What does a writer do in a wounded world? His writing is great. He's a public intellectual of the first order, a figure yeah. like Benjamin Franklin or William James, who will be remembered in American 
history. Yeah. And, and the thing is, book is fantastic. He's, a, he's a he's a working scientist, but he's a passionate scientist in the in the zone of uh, John Muir, where his um, individual passion and his scientific expertise are often combined in the same sentences, and that's important to study and try to understand, so that you don't have the scientist as Mr. Spock, our recently departed Leonard Nimoy, which is the great image of the scientist in our culture unemotional, Vulcan, these are the facts. But then there's also this uh, second half, the raging human core inside that explodes. I mean, this is a great image of the scientist. Better, however, is to combine those two halves into the passionate scientist that cares, that puts on the table that they care, like Wilson does. And, you know, uh, what, one of the things Wilson said is we need to study ourselves as social creatures. Well, this scared people because we thought, well, maybe it's all about alpha males. Maybe it's all about r r might makes right. And the more we think of ourselves as creatures, the more we're just a bunch of gangsters and it's a kind of depressing subject. So let's not even study it. Wilson said, no, no, no. We need to know. Every knowledge can't hurt us. Let's study it as scientists and see if we can put it to use. And his student, Sarah Hurdy, is the one that wrote Mother Nature. And what she did was say, the first order look at the primates is not the whole story. Let's look at the female primates and see what happens amongst women of these cousin species of ours. It gets w way more interesting at that point. You need to read Herdy as well as Wilson to get the whole story. And it's quite a, an interesting, useful, and indeed inspiring story. And, and also just one more word about Wilson because and Bob interviewed him and has, has a really um, cool book of the interviews. The, the idea that we could study insects, I mean, just the way he did, but also that you're less terrified about losing your humanness when you see the greatness of other life forms, and obviously that's going to come up all day. But I... I just, I thought at one point, well, the solution is just to identify completely with animals because I'm sick of humans, I'm sick of the Democrats, I'm sick of all this, <laughs> so throw it, throw over the whole human thing. But I love humans, and I, I don't, I feel, I just hate the idea that you'd have to throw over your humanness, but, so I love that, that Wilson brings us to this knowledge path that we can so learn not in how it benefits us, but because there's this, you know, this besideness that we create with our knowledge. It's the least, least we can do. I really uh, recommend Wilson's latest book, The Meaning of Human Existence. It's short, <laughs> it's accessible, it's mm -hmm. just elegant. It's really wonderful. And it really, it's a, it, it's a, pres a doctor's prescription of how to live, how to think, how to behave, it's, it's really good. His science fiction novel about the ant people is, is wonderfully <laughs> clunky and bad, but in a good way. It's science fiction and it's, uh, you know, it's like 1950s science fiction, and so you've got to love it. Okay, thank you so much. I'm afraid we're out of time, um, but th and I wish we could keep going for another half an hour, but, but thanks so much for coming. I want to thank so much thank our panelists. Um, I'm loading.